Do you have a paranormal encounter you'd like to share with us? Send us an email with your story for a chance of it being featured on Weird World. I'm a 25-year-old woman from Romania and for the purpose of anonymity I will refer to myself as Sabrina. In my country we mainly practice an Eastern Orthodox denomination of Christianity. We believe in God and Jesus Christ, but although there are certain similarities with other denominations, there are also many differences. For example, we uphold a custom whereby we leave the deceased in their original position of passing for a night. This is what we call the sleeping duty or guard night. We also do not immediately remove the body from the house where a person has lived their entire life, as this is believed to help their spirit find its way to heaven more easily. Over the following two days, we move the body to the church where their loved ones, but not relatives, may come to pay respects to them. On the third day, we bury the body at the cemetery. This is where the priest chants prayers which help the spirit of the deceased to understand that they are no longer among the living. As Romanians, we are very spiritual people and believe that in the afterlife, any spirits that continue to linger in the world may be unable to move on. Understanding this is important to the story, which is quite elaborate. Unlike most, I have always considered myself to have five grandparents, three grandmothers and two grandfathers. My first grandfather, we'll call him Michael, died when I was just six years old due to suffering a heart attack in August of 2007. He had raised me up until that point and his death marked my life in a profound way as at the time, and like any other young child of my age, I was unable to grasp the significance of death. I would frequently dream about him and would receive from him messages and signs. I would often hear him in my dreams and would feel that he was guiding me to be a better person and so forth. But even then, when a child, I would know the difference between a dream and reality. His wife, who we'll call Anna, was actually my adoptive grandmother because my biological grandmother, named Margaret, had died when my mum was just two years old due to an unsuccessful attempt to end her own pregnancy. At the time, Romania had a strict law regarding this and women would often attempt it by themselves within the privacy of their homes. This is because no healthcare professionals would agree to assist with the procedure, as doing so carried with it a life sentence in prison. Margaret passed away from septicemia, and my mother grew up without a mother of her own until the age of six. Therefore, unfortunately, I never met her or knew anything about Margaret, who was my blood grandmother. However, this story is about my adoptive grandmother, called Anna, who was very spiritual, wise, kind-hearted, and intelligent. Despite having no children of her own, she adopted my mother and uncle. My grandfather Michael was at the time only dating her, but after my mother met her on a family visit to her town of Yazi, Moldova, they married soon after. My grandfather was a military general, and caring for two children aged six and thirteen years was difficult. It was because of my mother that they decided to get married. When she first saw Grandma Anna, my mother went straight up to her at the age of six, raised up both of her arms and asked in a cheerful voice, Hi, I am Christina. Would you like to be my mommy? My grandmother burst out crying, picked her up and an immediate connection with my mother formed, whom she would come to raise and love as her own. There was never the same for my uncle because he was by then 13 and had known his own mother, Margaret well how she had died and why. He denounced Anna and made her life much more difficult. He went on to have two children of his own, a boy and a girl. Anna raised the girl, but when the boy was born she had a health crisis that caused her to faint and hit her head. She felt unable to raise my cousin afterwards as she was afraid she would collapse again while holding the baby. My uncle never forgave her for that refusal and hated her all the more. When I was born, I was the light of my grandparents' life, particularly as I am the spitting image of my mother, same eyes, face and body shape, and they immediately took me in and cared for me, as my father worked three separate jobs and my mother was a paediatric nurse and worked in shifts. 
I loved growing up with Anna, who would meditate, tell me about her dreams, and teach me to decode them and their meaning. She told me of some ghost encounters she'd had in her life, and always advised me not to fear any spirit who came close to me, because ghosts see us as beams of light, which guide them to God when they are confused. So my grandmother Anna guided and supported me like this until I was 18 years old. We had become very close, and as I was living five minutes away from her at the time, I would visit her daily. I sometimes still sleep at her place. Anna's hobby was to foresee the future in some cards she then owned. Not tarot cards, but normal cards with some inscriptions, such as Encounter with Unknown Man, Beware, Distressed Child, and Careful, Dangerous Woman. On the New Year's morning of 2017, at 3.15am, I telephoned my grandma Anna so as to wish her a Happy New Year and let her know how much I and my family loved and appreciated her. I need to mention that Romanians rarely express their love by saying the phrase, I love you, to our parents or grandparents. We regard love as something that you should show by your actions in life and how you respect others, rather than simply stating it outright. But on that night, for the first time in 23 years, at that exact time, in 2017, I strongly felt the need to tell her that, and I still don't know why. Her voice changed, and I could hear her chuckle with soft, happy tears as she heard that, and she said she loved us all back and forever would. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, as I am a very sensitive and emotional person myself, and so the night went on normally. I had been at home with my fiancé at his house. The next day, on the 1st of January 2017, at 5.30pm, I received a phone call from my father, who had told me that Grandma Anna had passed away the previous night. I couldn't express in words how that made me feel. It was as if my heart left my body, as if my own life stopped, refusing to acknowledge that she was gone. I rushed home. The police and ambulance were there. They said she had passed from a heart attack due to the extreme weather, the same way my grandfather Michael did 11 years earlier. It had been cold outside, and on the inside of the house it had been too hot. She had been rushing to change her clothes, and her heart couldn't handle the temperature shift. Her body was unable to thermally balance itself. That is how she passed. However, what was bafflingly strange was her time of passing. I still had the log on my phone of our last call at 3.15am. The police and ambulance officers had inspected her and concluded her time of passing to be around midnight. I suspected there must be some margin of error in their estimation. However, when I asked them, they said there was no possibility that I could have spoken to her at 3.15am, as by that time the body would have already begun the rigor mortis stage. Then who on earth did I speak to? It was her phone number, her voice, and she seemed absolutely fine. Whether it was a sick joke or just medical error, it was certainly creepy. During Anna's funeral, I decided to write her a goodbye letter, and even though I knew no one would read it, I entertained the notion that she might take the message I had for her to heaven with her and pass it through to my grandmother, Margaret, and my two grandfathers, Michael and Peter. I wrote in that letter how very much I loved her and how grateful I felt to her for every sacrifice she had ever made for me. I also wished to tell Margaret, my real grandmother, that although we never had a chance to meet, that I loved her too. I placed that letter inside my grandmother's coffin, kissed her forehead, and watched her leave on her final journey. My mother knew about the letter, but she had yet to ask me about what I wrote in it. Then it happened again. After Anna's funeral, I received yet another phone call from my grandmother. On answering, I thought it was my father, because he was still using her phone to let all of our relatives from other countries know that she had passed. I picked up the phone and heard something unimaginable, impossible. I heard my nana, Anna, 
I heard her cheerful voice clearly, but with a strange, intermittent static occurring every time she paused. She had a soft, fading voice, conveying nothing scary, harsh or intimidating. It made me feel like she was actually there, although I will admit the whole situation terrified me considerably. Anna said to me, Hello dear, I rang to let you know that I have passed the message on and that I love you too. I couldn't reply as the phone call ended immediately after. It left me feeling so vulnerable as I thought maybe someone was playing a sick joke on me. But it couldn't be that. I saw my nana being buried myself. I saw the coffin being sealed. I saw the letter remain inside the coffin until the very last second. No one could have taken it out to read it. She had three sisters, but they too had all passed, and none of them had her voice. No one could have repeated her voice that flawlessly. But the even more frightening follow-up to that ordeal occurred exactly a week after that first phone call. I remember because it was the following Monday. My phone started ringing again from the same number. I reflexively answered, with the call from the previous week out of my mind, and heard the voice of a woman, a voice I couldn't sense a familiarity with. It was a pretty soft but firm voice. It seemed like a relatively young woman, and yet it had an experienced quality to it, perhaps of a woman between 30 and 40 years old. On this occasion, I was actually in the same room with my father, who had Anna's phone with him at the time when I received the call. In fact, her phone was right in front of me on the table and was not ringing. I opened her phone as I spoke on mine. Her phone had no battery and was completely drained, and yet I still received her phone call. I answered and I heard this strange woman begin to speak. Hello, sweetheart. You don't know me, but I know you. I received your message, and I love you too. Then yet again, the call immediately ended. It goes without saying that I started screaming and panicking so dramatically that my father immediately contacted the telephone service to find out who was pranking us, perhaps with some kind of number spoofing software. They investigated the caller's profile, her numbers dialed, and incoming. My number was not in her record of calls, so we decided to disable her number, and since then we have not received any further calls. However, I do go to the cemetery more often now to talk to family members. This year is the first anniversary of Anna's passing as I write this in 2019, so we have been celebrating her memory. However, for myself personally, I have no need to celebrate her memory as I feel as if she's constantly with me and in a real and tangible sense. I often have dreams of her. She often visits me at night. I'm describing them as dreams because I feel that if I were to conceive of them in any other way, it would make me feel insane. To all the people I know who encounter ghosts or the paranormal, I will now be saying what my grandmother Anna taught me throughout my life. Do not be afraid of them. They are harmless, just confused souls who perceive you as beams of light helping them to find God. However you feel about them will determine how they react to you and whether you'll end up being frightened by them.